the youth board member at large. And I also do communications for Fayetteville PAC. And I would like to welcome y'all to day three of our first annual Fayetteville PAC Injustice Week. Um, today, the topic is why we plea. And we have with us Miss Attorney Dawn Blakerow. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Attorney Dawn Blakegrove. I am the Executive Director of Emancipate NC. Before uh, becoming Executive Director of Emancipate NC, I worked for about 10 years with uh, North Carolina Prisoners Legal Services as a post-conviction attorney in that capacity. What I did was review literally thousands of um, guilty plea transcripts and try and uh and files. Um, so I'm inti intimately familiar with um, the coercive nature of um, plea bargaining, what it looks like and how it could be radically reformed with the right uh, district attorney at the helm. So I'm looking forward to talking about that some with us today. All right, and we also have our co-founder, President Ms. Kathy, would you like to introduce yourself, say anything, say a couple words before we get started? Sure, I'm Kathy Greggs. I'm the co-founder and president of Fayetteville PAC, and thank you everyone for joining us. And we thank attorney Don Blake Rowe for being in partnership with us for over these last years and getting justice for everyone. Thank you. All right, all right. And, and just make sure you look at the rest of our days, the rest of, of our Injustice Week on our Facebook page at Fayetteville PAC. And without further ado, I will turn over to Ms. Don Blake Grove for her presentation. All right, hey everybody. Um, I am going to jump in and share my screen so that we can um, we can see a full out presentation, or at least I can use some slides to talk a little bit about this system. First, I want to couch us in. Um, Apologize, hold on just a second. I'm struggling with getting my screen share up. But first I wanna couch us in, um, I wanna couch us in a little bit about what it means to be, um, what it means and the power of a district attorney because really and truly what we're talking about here is the power of your locally elected and that means countywide, sometimes multiple counties, but, um, prosecutorial districts are essentially local. And um, this PowerPoint presentation that I'm showing you right now is called Vote for Justice. And it is a training session that we do here at Emancipate NC that um, allows folks to get a better understanding and a grounding in who has the power within our criminal justice system, what they're doing with that power and how they could be using that power to create equity and fairness and to undo the harms of uh, a system that is deeply rooted and steeped in oppressive, uh, in oppressive practices, white supremacy and systemic and institutional racism. So let's just start with the big picture, okay? There are criminal justice problems in North Carolina, just like there are everywhere else. Um, some of the big problems that most of us are concerned with are things like mass incarceration, police accountability, use of the death penalty, cash bail, racism and bias, and the school to prison pipeline. All of these things, however, um, are intersectional, meaning that they all interact with one another and one feeds into the harm of the other in one way or another. And there are very um, serious actors, primarily our district attorneys, who have the power to change the way these systems and these problems within our criminal justice system impact our communities and hurt and exacerbate the harm that bias creates within our communities. So let's talk a little bit about what it means for these people to use their power in a way or the power that we give them. Because again, make no mistake, any elected official is only as powerful as the power that we give them as voters, okay? So the power is ours. So when we want to see and create systemic changes, this is how we do it. The equation is very, very simple. You have policies, policies that are set by criminal justice officials that you elect, right? Now, 
what policies, what those policies look like are going to depend directly on the advocacy that you are doing in your own community and what policies you are pushing, what things you want to see and how you want, how you are communicating to your criminal justice elected officials, what is important to you within your community and how you want them to use the power that you have given them with your vote, okay? Next, that, so good policies, plus actions that are taken by justice officials that you elect. What does that mean? That means that it is not enough to just talk a good game when you're an elected official, especially when you're a district attorney. It is not enough to just talk a good game. You have got to make your deeds match your words. So talking and having policies is great, but if they're not implementing those policies, if they're talking about things that are not showing up in the way that they run their office, they are not using their power to bring about the equity that those policies and that talk is designed to create, then it's not giving us what we need and things don't add up. But when we get good policies and we get elected officials who are not pretend progressives, but who have and will use the power of their office to make their deeds match their words, what we end up with is a criminal justice system that is fair, that is equitable. If that is possible, we end up with one that is more fair, that is more equitable than the one that we have. Now, alternatively, if we have policies that are set to further exacerbate um, systemic and institutional racism, if we have policies that are designed to, to build the gap of equity between black and brown people and everyone else, if we have policies that are designed and rooted in um, criminalizing poverty and keeping poor people poor, keeping black people under thumbs, and you couple that with elected officials who have no sense of obligation to the people, who do not make their deeds match their words, what you end up with is a criminal justice system in North Carolina like the one that we have right now, which is one that is not working for black and brown folks, right? So this is the equation. What we're gonna talk about today is how we change the pieces of this equation so that what we end up with is a system that is equitable, that is fair, and that keeps all of us safe. Okay, because the system that we have now does not do that. All right, so I'm gonna skip through these because we're not talking about the sheriff today. But hold on just a second. I, I am gonna talk a little bit. I wanna start with Christopher, okay? So sometimes the easiest way to help you understand the perils in the in a criminal justice system is to start with an individual. So let's, let's start out with Christopher and we're gonna take a journey today with Christopher. All right. So Christopher is riding in a car with some friends. Um, they're going to a get together. Christopher has a little bit of weed in his pocket. Um, his friends have some weed on them too, maybe, um, because they're, but the driver, but Christopher is speeding a little bit. So he gets pulled over by a state trooper that, that um, searches his car, searches him, searches his friends, finds the weed, and then arrests him. Okay, so Christopher is arrested. He's taken to uh, the county jail, wherever that is, and someone sets bond. Now, depending on who your district attorney is, Christopher might get a bond that is nothing. He might get a written promise or even, or even as much as a, a, cita a citation and release. So he doesn't even get arrested. He just gets a citation from that police officer who tells him, hey, you got a court date on this day and you go home. Or you got a DA that's like, look, I'm not, I'm not charging. I'm not pursuing criminal charges for personal possession of marijuana. What happens is your police officer lets Christopher go about his business. Why? Because the district attorney is the most powerful person in our criminal justice system. They have the power to determine how much people are charged, how often people are charged, what people are charged for. And because law enforcement can arrest people all day, but if the district attorney is not going to prosecute those people, law enforcement officers have no incentive for arresting people for things 
that district attorneys are not going to prosecute for. So what we need to make sure that we understand is that district attorneys hold all of the strings. They are the puppet masters of our criminal justice system. All right. And what that criminal, what that district attorney does and the policies that that district attorney sets has the impact of changing every piece of our criminal justice system, every entry point for black and brown people into the criminal justice system, okay? So Christopher is arrested. Now let's talk some about what a district attorney is and what they do. So a district attorney is a locally elected, um, we have 50 prosecutorial districts in North Carolina. There are 100 counties. Some of the larger counties only have, um, have one district attorney per county, like Wake County, Durham County, um, Mecklenburg County. Those counties have one district attorney. But some of the smaller rural counties in North Carolina are clumped together. So for example, Edgecombe, Nash, and Wilson, uh, yeah, Edgecombe, Nash, and Wilson are one prosecutorial district. So it's three counties, but it's still only one prosecutor for all three of those counties. Now, while that might sound like a lot of, of, of area, it's really not, right? Because the district attorney is not a statewide elected office. Only the people that live in their prosecutorial district get to vote for your district attorney. That means the universe of, of people who have the power and the influence to change the way that your district attorney approaches the criminal justice system and how they do their jobs is much, much smaller. And because that universe is smaller, it means that each person within that universe has so much more power and such a big voice in changing the way that district attorney moves and the way that district attorney implements policies. Um, and that goes from how they set bail all the way down to, or all the way up to whether or not they seek the death penalty. But somewhere in the middle there, which is a very important piece, is how they do plea negotiations what plea negotiations look like, how they are used, and whether or not a plea will even be offered. So we're going to get to that in a second. But first, I want to talk to you all a little bit about what district attorneys do. District attorneys choose whether or not to charge someone with a crime at all. So before we even get to the place where we're talking about a plea agreement, the first thing we have to decide and the first power that the district attorney has is whether or not they're going to charge someone with a crime or not. Hear me when I say to you that district attorneys have full power and control over whether or not a person is charged with a crime. They are the sole deciders, they and their office are the sole deciders of whether or not the statute or the laws have been violated in a way that require prosecution. Now, sometimes you'll hear district attorneys and say, oh, well, I don't have a choice, I have to follow the law. So let me be clear, that's garbage, right? They should follow the law, but they don't, not all the time. Because in North Carolina, we have so many laws on the books that invariably, while I am sitting here, while James is sitting here, while you are sitting here watching this live stream, I guarantee you there is at least three laws that we are breaking right now, just sitting here, three North Carolina laws that we are breaking. Because North Carolina has an un an insane amount of activity that is criminalized in our General Assembly, um, in our legislative uh, laws. That being said, district attorneys and police officers, none of them are enforcing every law that is on the books. They are not uh, criminalizing everything that is actually a crime. They are not prosecuting everything that is actually a crime. They are making choices. So no matter what they say about how their hands are tied, make no mistake that that is complete and utter garbage. District attorneys have the full power to charge or not charge whomever they want. Now, perfect example. Let's look at, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the shooting of Andrew Brown Jr. in Elizabeth City, 
by the Pasquotank Sheriff's Department. Andrew Womble, who is the district attorney in Pasquotank County right now, made a unilateral decision that those officers had not violated the law and as a result would not face criminal charges. Despite the fact that everyone else in the world looked at that and was like, say what? What? Even the governor and the attorney general were like, eh, we might need a special prosecutor here. In North Carolina, if the district attorney who was in charge of that case, if the district attorney in the jurisdiction where that crime is alleged to have happened, if that person says no crime was committed, that's it. No crime was committed. There is no way to bring state charges against those sheriffs who murdered Andrew Brown in cold blood if, Womble, if, if Andrew Womble decides, which he did, that no crime was, was, was committed unilaterally, right? He doesn't have to answer to anyone. There's no way to appeal that decision. It just stands. Now, the same way that Andrew Womble decided that these sheriffs in Pasco Tank did not murder in cold blood Andrew Brown, that district attorney also has the power to say, but the people who were protesting the murder of Andrew Brown, uh, those people, they were committing violent crimes. They were committing crimes. And I am going to charge them and I am going to prosecute them. So the first thing you need to understand about plea agreements is just because you have a crime, have been charged with a crime, does not mean that you have a right to be offered a plea. You don't. You do not have a right to be offered a plea. And a district attorney can flat out say, nope, I'm not offering a plea and I'm gonna force you to take this to trial. Now, does that happen very often? It depends, right? But the reality is y'all that 94% of cases in North Carolina or any other state in the country, 94% of those cases are resolved by guilty pleas. What does that mean? That means 6% of people who are charged with a crime actually get a full jury trial. So what we're gonna talk about today is why. Why does that happen? And I wanna be fair when I talk about plea agreements because um, there are situations and a plea agreement, the, the, the prospect of a plea agreement can be used in a way that is fair, sort of, right? It can be, uh, it just isn't very often, but it can be. Again, and this is something, this is the, the epitome of what institutional racism is, right? What systemic racism is. Just because something on its face looks equitable, it doesn't mean that it's used equitably. If it's used in a way that creates a disparate outcome, that creates an unfair outcome, that creates an inequitable outcome, then it is systemic and institutional racism. That is what happens with plea agreements all across the country. That is what happens with plea agreements. It is not the process of the plea agreement that is problematic. It is the way that process is used and the, the gross imbalance of power between the district attorney and the person who was accused and who has the most leverage and who has the most power and how they use that power. Because in essence, a plea bargain is a contract. It's a contract between the defendant or the accused and the state where they're supposed to be negotiating the terms of that contract. And when both of them, when both sides feel as though they have gotten some type of leverage, some type of benefit for whatever it is that they're giving up, then they agree on that contract, the terms of those contracts, and they enter that guilty plea. Now, I am not here to tell you, nor will I ever tell you that every guilty plea is a bad move. Because hear me when I tell you, if, um, if you know that you 
that you stole your grandmama pocketbook and she got a camera on her porch that got a video of you stealing her pocketbook and then she see you and then call the police and tell them I know it was him because I saw him I'm looking right at him he my child I know him he stole my pocketbook and you talk about taking it to trial that might not be a good idea for you I mean you could take it to trial you go right ahead and whether or not it's going to be a good idea for you is going to depend on what? It's going to depend on the terms of a plea offer if it's offered by the district attorney, right? In this case, sometimes you will see a plea, and I want to talk some about plea agreements in the way that they're used that are not bad, because all pleas, by no stretch of the imagination, are bad for the defendant. They are just for the accused. They're just not. And I'm not going to tell you that they all are. Many, many times I have looked at a client's case and said, yeah, entering this plea was the best thing you could possibly do for yourself. However, there is an imbalance of power between the defendant and the state that disproportionately makes entering a plea agreement for the accused not like entering a contract. It's more like... Um, well, it does. It is sometimes like entering a contract, except it's like entering a contract with a gun to your head, right? Do you have the option to make the choice? Technically, yes. But is the choice one that is reasonable, one that is fair, and one that you actually have a voice in? Most of the time, it's not, okay? So let's talk about plea agreements, what they look like, and how they are used in a way that is coercive. So district attorneys decide whether or not you're gonna be charged. They decide um, how many charges you are gonna face. Um, that is a key component in the abuse of the plea agreement, because here's how. Very, very often um, you will commit, let's go back to Christopher with this weed in his pocket, okay? Let's say that Christopher is 19, he gets caught with some weed, um, they find a, a, a bong, right, in his car, some paper, some, you know, some, I don't even know, I don't think the children roll paper, the, the whatever, the, the Dutchie, the thing, they put the weed in, whatever it is, right? They find all that stuff in the car too, right? And, and maybe they find, let's say, some little roaches in, in, the, in, the, in the ashtray in his car from weed that they smoked before, okay? Now, what they could charge Christopher with is nothing. Or they could charge Christopher with simple possession. Or, like we see most often, your district attorney is going to charge Christopher with possession, with uh, possession of marijuana, with possession of paraphernalia related to marijuana. Um, if Christopher is 19 and he's with some of his friends that he played high school football with that are still in high school, let's say those kids are 16, right? He could be charged with contributing to the delinquency of a minor. He could also be charged with um, maintaining an automobile for the sale or distribution of a drug. Okay, that's a lot of charges from a weed from a from a joint, right? But that's what can happen, and that's what we see happen very very often especially in situations where district attorneys know, right? That they don't wanna take this case to trial. They know that they wanna get a plea agreement. So they charge Christopher with five or six charges, many of which they know they don't even have the evidence to secure a conviction on, but Christopher doesn't know that. So they charge him with five or six charges and tell him, this is the plea agreement we're gonna give you. We're gonna drop three of these five charges if you plead guilty to two of them. That sounds like a good deal on his face, right? Except that four of those five charges are probably garbage charges in the first place that they never could prosecute and win on if they even tried. But they're counting on the fact that Christopher doesn't know that. And that Christopher is going to make a calculated decision because then what they're going to tell Christopher is this. If we charge you, if you get convicted of all of these charges and, and the charges are all run consecutively, your sentences are all run consecutively, 
you could be looking at 10 years of probation as opposed to six months of probation. So one of the reasons why people enter plea agreements, especially plea agreements that don't seem to make sense to us, that's why, is because the district attorney is using their power, the power to charge, the power to overcharge, to scare folks into entering plea agreements that are in actuality are never are not even really attainable. Like they can't even really get these charges if they wanted to. They couldn't get these convictions if they wanted to. If you made them take a trial, they couldn't get these convictions, but Christopher doesn't know that. And, and just because there's no evidence doesn't mean that they can't get those convictions, right or wrong, y'all. How many of us, everybody here that's watching, everybody within the sound of my voice knows somebody that got convicted of something they didn't do simply because they were black and they were in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people at the wrong time. Sometimes it's because they was black and the police decided that they was the one that did it, right? And so for, so for many, many folks, when we know what the system does, we know how much bias and racism exists inside of the system. If I'm, even if I know that I'm innocent, even if I know that I didn't commit five of or four of the five charges that you have against me, because the system is so radically biased and skewed, I cannot with certainty know that I won't get convicted on all five of those charges and be exposed to a long period of punishment or confinement with the state. So one of the ways that district attorneys use their power for plea agreements, one of the reasons why our people plea is out of fear. And that fear is created, that fear is a false fear in theory that is created by district attorneys who turn, who, who know that they intentionally overcharge people so that they can use all those extra charges as a way to Oh shoot! As a way to um, as a way to coerce you to to scare you into entering this guilty plea. What are other ways? Other ways that they do it, and and some of the more insidious thing. One of the ways that they use the death penalty, for example, is one of the more insidious ways that district attorneys use um, coercion in plea agreements. Because very very often in cases where they say, "Well, we're gonna if you take this to trial." We are going to charge you capital. We are going to put you on trial for your life if you exercise your constitutional right to take this to trial. And what people say is, what people say is, what, what anybody would say, right, is if I have an opportunity not to, not to die, right, in exchange for LWAP, life without the possibility of parole, even though you're still just gonna sit in prison for the rest of your life anyways, you're gonna take that chance. You're gonna take that out. Now, here's the, here's the thing they don't tell you, that North Carolina hasn't executed anyone in 15 years. That juries in North Carolina don't have a stomach necessarily for sending people to death row. For example, in Wake County, Lauren Freeman charges, um, charges people capitally more than uh, almost all of the other district attorneys in the state. She uses the, the death penalty more than anyone else and tries cases capitally more than, almost more than anyone else in the state. Capital trials are probably three to four times more expensive than just a regular, a regular LWAP trial, okay? And you're more likely than not to end up with a guilty verdict, but a jury that's not willing to give you the death penalty. So in 
nine of the 10, uh, nine of the last 10 death penalty trials that have been tried in Wake County by our current district attorney, Lauren Freeman, the jury has returned a verdict of guilty, but not sentenced persons to death. Okay. So, but if you're facing, if you're looking at a district attorney who is telling you, I am going to kill you, I am going to ask the state to kill you. And that is a possibility, right? That is a possibility that could happen. Or you enter a guilty plea, plead guilty to something that you didn't do. Or even if you did do it, I mean, I don't really care, but you plead guilty and you avoid the death penalty. But what they don't tell you is that whether you get the death penalty or not, the chances that you will die of a heart attack in North Carolina on death row are higher than you being executed because we haven't executed anyone in the last 15 years. And we cannot execute anyone in the foreseeable future because of pending litigation, but they're not gonna tell you. That is an abuse of power, in my opinion. Now, legally, it's not an abuse of power. Legally, it is not. But just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. And that is why it is so important for the people to understand how district attorneys are using these tools of coercion, using the power that we give them to exploit people that look like us and to abuse the system. Um, Okay, I've talked a lot. Are there, Kathy, are there any questions? I want to stop for a second. Are there any questions that anybody has so far? Yes, I do have some in the chat. So the first question is, what is the benefit of the DA using fear to scare a person into an agreement? How does that look? Oh, that's a great question. What is the benefit? The benefit for the district attorney is if you enter a plea agreement, they don't have to take it to trial, right? Then it's done. You enter a plea agreement that could take, I mean, you go into court, you enter a plea agreement. I mean, the most the most drawn out plea agreement to enter a plea from start to finish is not gonna take more than an hour. Because why? Everybody's already agreed that you're guilty. Everybody's agreed that you're guilty, or at least you've agreed that you want to plead no contest, which is an option where you say, I'm not saying I did it, but I'm saying that it's enough evidence that if you took it to trial, you could convict me. That's what a no contest, that's what a no contest plea is. It's still saying that you're guilty. It still acts like a guilty plea. But what you're technically saying is that I didn't, I'm not saying that I committed this crime, but I am acknowledging that there is enough evidence that if you charge me with this crime and you put me on trial for this crime, I could be convicted. So the million dollar question is why? Why would you use fear? It goes back to that statistic that I shared with you at the very onset of of this live stream, 94%. 94 percent of trials in state courts or excuse me 94 percent of convictions in state court are secured by guilty plea imagine what would happen if 94 percent of those cases that that only spend an hour in court at the most to get them completely finished from start to from start to bottom if they all wanted to go to trial. If everybody took their case to trial, it would have the effect of shutting down, literally and figuratively, our criminal justice system. It would bring our criminal justice system to a grinding halt. Now, what does that look like, you may ask? We are all in the dubious position of knowing exactly what that looks like because we saw it for the last two years with COVID. So anyone who has been in jail or who has been awaiting trial, whether they intend to plead guilty or not, have sat in jail all across the country for at least the last two years, right? So we're already terribly backed up 
criminal justice system is already crazy backed up, right? With trials. I, I talk to folks sometimes y'all that have been sitting in jail on pending charges for four years, four, five years waiting to go to trial. And that's another tool of coercion, right? So district attorneys need people to enter guilty pleas because if they didn't, they could not, it, they literally could not try all of the cases that they charge. Now, some, some people might say, well, is that, why is that? I would argue that that is because way too many people are being charged with crime. They are overcharging people and they are charging way too many people with crimes, which is how we ended up with mass incarceration in the first place, not because people committed more crimes, but because district attorneys charged people with more crimes and because they were charging people with more things, they were ending up with much longer sentences. And so when people end up with much longer sentences, then what happens is that you're, they, they go in and they don't come out. So one of the reasons that district attorneys want to use coercion to uh, get people to enter guilty pleas is because they do not, and our criminal justice system does not have the capacity for everyone to exercise their constitutional right to trial. Now, that does not mean you don't have the right to demand a trial if you want one, because we all could, everyone could, but what we also know is that because of the unchecked power of the district attorney, for many people, if they choose to exercise that right to trial, they are going to feel the wrath of the district attorney's office, and they are going to pay for it with excessive charges and extended sentences. Any other questions, Kathy? Yes, I do. I have <clears throat> I have another question. The question is what happens to the DA when they hurt any innocent person? This is from the chat online and then I have a question in the inbox on Zoom. I'm not sure I understand the question. What happens? Oh. No, what happens if they uh, yeah, hurt what happens when they, nothing? Nothing. Nothing happens. They say, oops, my bad. Sometimes. So we'll and see. most of the time, no, I'm serious. Nothing happens. And that is, and oops, my bad, you might get if you're able to prove that you were railroaded into entering a guilty plea um, to something that you were not guilty of. Part of entering a guilty plea, however, is that you give up in North Carolina your constitutional right to appeal. That conviction, that is part of the thing, that, that is part of the guilty plea. So you lose your right to, if you plead guilty, you automatically lose your right to challenge that conviction. Now, you can still challenge it, but you do not have a right to challenge it like you would have if you were found guilty in a jury trial. There's an automatic right to appeal if you go to trial. With the guilty plea, you do not have that automatic right to appeal. So it makes district attorneys' lives much, much easier, and it makes it much harder to determine that someone has pled guilty to a charge or to a crime that they didn't commit because that person has to fight even harder to exonerate themselves because they don't have the normal avenues for, um, for challenging their conviction, okay? So what happens to district attorneys when it is discovered that they have prosecuted um, a person that is that is innocent, most of the time, nothing. Oops, I'm sorry. If that person is lucky enough to get a commutation from the governor in North Carolina, they may be able to secure compensation for the time that they were spent, for the time that they spent um, in prison on a, for, um, for a crime that they didn't commit. However, I think, and I could be, I could have this number wrong, so don't hold me to it. But I think in North Carolina, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar cap on how much money you can get in restitution. But so for somebody like Ronnie Long, who spent forty four years in prison for a crime that he didn't commit, 
he maxes out at uh, $750,000 that he is eligible for. But mo uh, so many folks who are found to be not guilty or who are found to be innocent are never get that commutation and aren't even eligible to get any money from the state. But for, for a person like Ronnie Long who spent seven, who spent 44 years in prison, $750,000 averages out to somewhere around 19 to $20,000 a year for all the time that he lost. There is no punishment for district attorneys who pursue charges against innocent people and pursue convictions against innocent people. There really is not. So one of, one of the things that we also need to advocate for is a check on the power of district attorneys and a real, a real mechanism for holding them accountable when they intentionally and coercively send innocent people to prison. Those are leg legislative changes that we need to be asking for. Any other and, questions, Kathy? Yeah, one yes, more. Yes. Can a parent um, void a plea agreement for their children, their minor? No. Um, okay, and so let no is the short answer. But let's talk about how you get there. If a child who is so in North Carolina, um, up until December first of twenty nineteen, any sixteen or seventeen year old was treated like an adult. What that necessarily means is that if you are treated like an adult, when you are charged with a crime in North Carolina, then you lose the, the protections that come with being a juvenile, right? So if you are treated as an adult in North Carolina at 16 and 17, and still in North Carolina to this day for charges, uh, so felony charges higher than a G felony, um, you are still treated like an adult automatically. Your parent has very little to no say in what happens and what decisions that you make legally around entering plea agreements and things like that. Now, until you reach the age of 18, the age of majority, your parent or your guardian has a right to be present when you are, when you are being questioned and has a right to, um, to be there to advise you. But what they cannot do is make decisions for you. So if you decide that your child has entered a plea agreement that had you been in the room with him or her, um, you would not have allowed that child to enter into that plea agreement, there is virtually nothing that you can do as a parent, specifically from the place that you believe your child was taken advantage of by adults. There's nothing that you can do with it. There's no mechanism within the system for a parent to be able to challenge that conviction, none whatsoever. Okay, I have a question in the chat. Can a DA run two consecutive sentences concurrent after the offender has taken a plea? So can mm. they come back and run it again? Um, yes. I, okay, let me, let me, yes, but let me tell you how. So if, if the question was, can a district attorney run two concurrent, can two consecutive sentences, that means box card. So one has to be finished and then the other one has to be finished. Can they later go back and take that consecutive, those two consecutive sentences and make them run concurrently? Concurrently means they're at the same time. So they're stacked on top of each other, right? So for every, so when you have two sentences that are run concurrently, for every day that you serve, you are getting credit one day of credit on each one of those sentences, as opposed to if those sentences are being served consecutively, for every day you serve, you only get credit towards one of those sentences. And you have to do all of the days of that one sentence before you start earning any days towards the second sentence, okay? Now, having explained that, um, the question was, can a DA take a, consec a concurrent, a consecutive, two consecutive sentences, and then later on run them concurrent. They can. Um, and the way, the mechanism for doing that is a motion for appropriate relief. 
Um, district attorneys can file on their own motions for appropriate relief um, when they believe that there has been an error, in an error in sentencing in a case, and they can go back and they can make the, um, they can change the sentence so that it is shorter or so that it is, um, well, not I shouldn't say change. Sorry, y'all don't want to get too deep into the weeds. Um, but there is a way that a district attorney who has the desire to go back and fix a bad sentence can make that happen. There are mechanisms that exist that allow for that to happen. And the beauty of that is that if it is something that is initiated by the district attorney, because as a post-conviction attorney with North Carolina Prisoners Legal Services, I filed what were called motions for appropriate relief all the time. But if, but, and in the vast majority of cases, those motions are opposed by the district attorney. What does that mean? That means I believe that a person has been sentenced incorrectly, has been sentenced unfairly, or is innocent of a charge that he has been, he or she has pled guilty to, or has been convicted of. The district attorney, and then I write that all out, what the law is, why, what the facts is to support why I believe this person um, is not guilty or um, was is serving an illegal sentence. Um, or there's new evidence to show that they didn't do it. And then um, I serve that on the court and the district attorney, district attorney either has the option of saying, you know what, I agree with you. This is, this is messed up. This is excessive. This is too much. And if the DA says that and goes in front of the judge, there is a 99.9% .9 chance that whatever relief I'm asking for, whatever a relief in sentencing is being asked for, is going to happen. The problem is that the vast majority of district attorneys, when faced with evidence that there was an error in sentencing, that there was an error in their conviction, that they convicted the wrong person with a motion for appropriate relief, they're going to oppose it. Why? Because they don't like to be wrong and they don't like to lose. And because they can't. And very often, if you have a district attorney that opposes a motion for appropriate relief to correct um, a bad conviction, you're gonna lose. Um, I'll give y'all an example. <clears throat> it's a case, any lawyer who's practiced um, for any amount of time has a case, at least one, that haunts them. This is mine. So um, it was, a case where I filed a motion for appropriate relief, where there was newly discovered evidence. It was a, a, a case where the, where the young man was accused of rape and uh, the victim had told multiple people that it was consensual. Um, so we filed a motion for appropriate relief. Um, we, and, and these kids didn't enter a guilty plea. It was a bunch of, about, about three of them. They never turned on each other. They never testified against each other. They all said it was consensual, always. Uh, I filed a motion for appropriate relief. The state does not respond. So they don't oppose it or, or anything. They just don't respond. The judge grants it, grants my kid a new trial, says that the conviction is wrong, that the MAR, there's enough evidence in the MAR to support overturning that conviction. He overturns the conviction, and then the state has to re re-prosecute that kid, re retry that trial, that case. So I get the motion for the trial to be, uh, for the conviction to be vacated, for the conviction to be overturned. When the DA sees the order that the judge has overturned the conviction, the DA goes to the judge and says, oh, had I known you were gonna undo this conviction, had I known you were going to um, vacate this conviction, set aside this conviction, I would have responded in opposition, right? Now, in normal circumstances, you would be like, oh, well, so not here. The judge goes, oh, you should have told me that. So I'm gonna rescind this order. I'm not gonna vacate this. I didn't know that you didn't want it. Now they didn't file anything, right? They didn't file anything proving that their case was right or that the evidence that we had presented as to why this conviction was faulty was wrong. They just said, oh, if we knew you was gonna let them go, we would have said no. And that was enough for the judge to be like, oh, all right then, my bad. 
I fought that case for five years, um, took it all the way to the state Supreme Court and lost. And that, that child is still sitting in prison. He was 19 when he got convicted and he got 35 years. Yeah. So what happens when district attorneys get it wrong? Nothing. Nothing happens when they get it wrong. Is there a mechanism to get it right? Yes. But it is not a mechanism. I mean, but, but it is a mechanism that exists within the same racist, biased systems that produce the convictions. And as a result of that, uh, the same racism, the same systemic and institutional biases that um, stack the system against uh, a person who is accused of a crime, they still exist. And so you have the same, same uphill battles. That is not a very uh, warm and fuzzy story, but it is, <laughs> it is the truth of what we're dealing with. And it is a perfect example of why and, but here, let me be clear. The only reason, the only reason that child was able, that I was able to fight for five years for that baby was because he had taken his case to trial. Had he entered a guilty plea, he wouldn't even have had those options. His options would have been severely limited. The evidence that was used to support his conviction, I wouldn't have had a, because there's no transcript of a guilty plea right? What does that mean? You know how you sometimes we hear folks talk about a transcript from a trial where they can read verbatim everything that somebody said. Well, those don't exist in guilty pleas. There is no stenographer in the courtroom that's recording everything that's said. So with a guilty plea, all you have is the paper and your, the word of your, of, of your client and whatever evidence that you can find to show that um, that that this person pled guilty to something that they were not guilty of. But it's hard to overcome a guilty plea. Why? Because it is that. Because what people say, what most people say is who pleads guilty to something they didn't do. Lots of people, all the dang on time. All right, Kathy, any more questions for me? Oh yeah, I got some. I'm going to take one from the chat. Is it illegal for a DA office to charge defendants with unsolved crimes because of their general description? Absolutely not. District attorney has, <laughs> the district attorney has charging power. Let me be clear, y'all. They can charge you with whatever they want to charge you with. They choose. They choose what charges, if any, a person faces, period doesn't matter how much evidence there is or isn't. Ultimately, the decision is with the district attorney and they choose. There is no checks and balances on that power. So a district attorney has the power to charge you with whatever they want to charge you with. Now, whether or not they get an indictment is a different question, but there is a saying because that sometimes it has to go in front of the grand. Now this is getting way into the weeds, y'all. But it has to go to a grand jury, and a jury had they have the district attorney has to present the evidence that they have, and they have to be able to show um, by a preponderance of the evidence that it's more likely than not that the person that they are accusing, um, a accusing of the crime, was the person that committed it. Right. Um, we see have we see this process play out a lot in um, police involved shootings across the country, where there is this huge big thing about like oh you know there's this whole it takes weeks and weeks and weeks to do a grand jury presentation weeks and weeks and weeks for a jury to decide whether or not they're going to bring back an indictment. That is such a skew and an unrealistic view of what that process actually looks like. In real life, in real life, what is said, a, a phrase that is used in um, the legal system on a regular basis is that a district attorney can get an indictment for a ham sandwich. That's it. 
they're going to get that indictment if they want. There is not this grandiose uh, our finding the truth, even though there should be, that's not the way the system plays out. So if a district attorney wants to charge you with something, it doesn't matter if they have no evidence at all. If all the, many, many, many times, the only evidence is uh, you get pulled over because you are a black man wearing a red hoodie, because that's the description. And if the law enforcement decides that you're the person that committed the crime and their investigation is such that everything that they do is designed to point to you being the perpetrator, by the time the district attorney gets that case, it doesn't even matter if you did it or not. All it really matters is if they can get a jury to convict you or if they can scare you more, more 94% of the time, or if they can scare you with enough time, with enough negative consequences that you're too afraid not to accept guilt. Because if you don't accept guilt, then what you could end up with is much, much worse. That is the insidious nature of guilty pleas. And that is why so often we get it wrong. But because guilty pleas, people who enter guilty pleas do not have a constitutional right, a guaranteed right to appeal that conviction, we almost never see, we, and there's no way to know how many innocent people are sitting in prisons or languishing with um, criminal convictions for things that they just didn't do, that they pled guilty to because it was a lot easier, or hell, a lot of times just because they want to go home, because they can't afford bond, right? Because the bail system is another way, another coercive tool that DAs use in order to get people to enter guilty pleas, right? Let's say you, you are charged with, let's go back to Christopher. <laughs> So they give Chris, Christopher has a little bit of weed, but they not charged him with, you know, possession with 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 intention to to sell and distribute. Um, they charge him with maintaining a vehicle for distribution. They charge him with possession. They charge him with with uh, with contributing to the delinquency of a minor. Right now, I want you to to think about, and, and this is on us too, y'all. Right? I want you to think about, you hear those five charges read off on the, on the evening news. And they say to you, and this boy has a $500,000 bond. How many of us would be like, mm, he sound dangerous, I'm glad he in jail. Not even question whether or not the charges are such that they have been so trumped up, so blown out of proportion so that number one, we get that high bail, and number two, so that Christopher um, is so afraid of the of the punishment that he could receive for all these things that he didn't do, he's more inclined to just plead guilty to something, anything, to avoid all of what he is facing, right? So let's say uh, Christopher though gets a five hundred thousand dollar bond, and he's like, you know what? I don't care. Put 12 in a block, put 12 in a box, I'm taking it to trial. What the DA will do is make Christopher sick. Because in North Carolina, the district attorney has the power to determine when Christopher's case goes to trial, okay? That is called calendaring power. So let's say the district attorney says, ain't no way I can convict Christopher of all of these five charges. It, it's no way, I don't have the evidence. So instead of just letting Christopher go and saying, okay, I'm gonna dismiss these charges that I can't move forward with and move forward on the charges that I can, they're gonna make Christopher sick. Months, maybe, in a county jail, years even. Waiting for Christopher. And then every couple of weeks they'd come to Christopher and say, you know, if you enter a guilty plea, you could go home. If you plead guilty to two, of these five, to one of these five charges, you can go home, Christopher says no. And they say, okay, we'll keep sitting. Then they come back 30 days later and say, Christopher, now forget the one, now you gotta plead guilty to two because you didn't take the first plea I gave. You. 
So that one's off the table. That goes away. Once you say you don't want it, that one goes away. So now you plead guilty to two of these five and I'll let you go home. Christopher says, now nah, I'm gonna take my chances at trial. The state know that they can't, they can't prove this stuff at trial. They know they got a better chance of doing what? Waiting Christopher out. So let's say six months goes by. Christopher has lost his scholarship. He has lost his job. He has lost his car. He has lost his girlfriend. His mama is so sad every day because she can't see him. He tired of being in jail. He then he done got into fights. He um he has some kind of Christopher has diabetes and they won't give him his insulin. So he done got so sick sitting in the county jail because he not doesn't have access to good health care. So a year goes by and they come back to Christopher. Now Christopher is sick because his sugar is out of control. He tired. He ain't seen his mom. He done lost a lot. And they say, Christopher, you plead guilty to four of these five. We'll give you probation and let you go home. We'll give you time served and let you go home. Hell, we'll give you a five to 10 year prison sentence but at least you get to come out of the county jail and get to go into a prison state facility where you're gonna get better care, where you're gonna get better food, where you're going to get have access to, to services. Not much better, but certainly better than the county jail. By that fifth time they come back, Christopher taking that plea. And who could blame him? Who could blame him? Because the people that are offering the plea have the power to make him sit in that jail indefinitely. Like I told y'all, I know I talked to some folks and this was a year ago. So they still sitting in that same jail cell. So they've been sitting in jail five years, five years awaiting trial. Just waiting to go to trial. I don't know a coercion that's, that's stronger than that. And that's why plea, plea, guilty pleas and who we elect as your district attorney is so important because they have so much power, so much power to affect the way that our criminal justice system looks and behaves, the way that, that equity and fairness shows up in our criminal system or doesn't. And more often than not, it's not, doesn't show up. And folks like Christopher enter a guilty plea after sitting in jail for five years for charges that the state knew they could not convict him on. No, they don't have the evidence to take the trial, but they know that if they wait long enough, they torture him long enough, they hold him as a political prisoner long enough, he'll give, he'll blink. And they got all the power to make him do that. That is the, that is the insidious nature of plea agreements and the way that the district attorneys have the power to abuse them. Any other questions, Kathy? Yeah, can a DA dismiss any, any case regardless of the nature without the offender being present? And then I got one more that I think is gonna be a long question, but go ahead. Can they dismiss charges without the offender being present? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. She said they, they can just withdraw, they can withdraw charges. Can a yeah, DA, it says, can a DA dismiss any case regardless of the nature without the offender being present? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. If the state at any point, the state can say, uh, uh, well, I should say at any point up until, um, no, at any point, the state can say, you know what? We don't have the evidence to proceed with this. We can, we can, we don't have the evidence to, to, to prove this crime happened. As a result, we cannot move forward with trial. As a result, we are withdrawing these charges. They can do that whenever they want to. Yes, hard stop. Thank you. One more question. Um, this is gonna be a long one and I'm sure you have seen cases like this because we have some that you have been involved with here in Fayetteville and Cumberland County. 
whenever you have a case where a defender is um, actually questioned, I'm sorry, whenever the person is in question, if all the police officers have been fired or resigned, um, how would that case look in, in court? Should they um, dismiss the case or should the DA be charged or how does that work whenever the police officers have all been resigned or fired? Depends. Again, there is no, and I want to make it as quick. Actually, this is a really short question. It is always going to be up to that district attorney what they do with those charges. Now, can they secure a conviction if all of the cops have been fired? Maybe. Is there some mechanism in law that says if this many police officers who investigated this 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 charge, this many, um, this many facts have been proven to be untrue. This many, this officer is a is a known liar, right? And we know fabricated evidence. Is there? If the question is, is there a mechanism in the law that in that situation the district attorney has no choice, no option but to dismiss that trial, that conviction, or that charge rather? The answer is no. There is no mechanism that exists like that. That DA can keep that charge and hold on to those charges and keep those charges going for as long as they want. Now, will it possibly open them up to civil liability later on from the person who who they may sit in jail and, and subjected to a criminal process when they knew uh, that they could not, uh, that the evidence did not support that this person was guilty. It, it definitely opens them up to that possibility. But also, which is one of the other uh, topics I think that y'all have either you have already addressed or you will be addressing, there's a sovereign immunity that elected officials and state actors have that protect them. Protect them personally from personal liability for acts that they do um, while they are, uh, or for think for harm that they cause while they are acting um, under the color of their elected position. So yeah, the answer is yes. They can absolutely, they can absolutely Keep not dismiss charges when all of the people, when all of the victims won't show up, when there are no victims, when everybody says this isn't the right person, when the cops are all fired for lying and fabricating evidence, it is still in the discretion of the district attorney whether or not they dismiss those charges, still. Thank you. And I have a question. Have you ever seen where a judge disagreed with the DA um, and ultimately agrees with the attorney. So have you ever seen a case like that? Yes, just... yes, 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 absolutely. I have seen cases and, and that's why elections matter, right? Because if you have good judges on the bench, good a good judge on the bench can look at a charge and say, there was absolutely no evidence to support this charge. And I'm dismissing this. I'm dismissing this case because there is no factual evidence to support this particular charge. Judges can do that. They do it in district court a lot. Um, I shouldn't say a lot, but I, I know some folks who do it a lot in district court. Um, and that's why elections matter. If you get the right folks on the bench, you get the right folks with the right power Again, these systems are not, these systems are inherently racist, not because the laws or the rules or the policies are racist on their face. It's because of the way that they are applied, right? So if you get the right people who have the fortitude to apply the rules in the way that they are written so that they have fair non-desperate outcomes, it works. It's just that we know that only in theory because we've never actually seen it. 
because the system is such that it um, it promulgates and all of the system actors, the vast majority of system actors uh, benefit from the systemic and institutional racism and the oppressive biases that exist in our system. So they have a vested interest in maintaining those systems. That's the problem. That is pretty much the huge problem, the biggest <laughs> problem to address. Yeah. And you know, it's been being addressed for over 400 something years now, just the system itself. Um, I did have a question and I know you can probably caveat um, that we do express this a lot when it comes to Fayetteville PAC. I just wanna make sure everybody understands that not all attorneys know how to do trial. Um, some of them want to police because they don't want to go to trial because they don't know how to conduct a trial. So <laughs> that's another question to ask you. There's a lot of attorneys that's out there that may say they're going to take stuff to trial. And then at the end, you sitting there with a plea or a civil suit versus criminal charges against that individual is because they don't know how to do trial. Is that well, well, and yeah, and when you got 94% of state trials and 97, 94% of state convictions, and 97% of federal convictions that are resolved by guilty plea, there is no question that a lot of folks <laughs> don't know how to take stuff to trial because it's so few things that are going to trial, right? Like lots, there, it's not like everybody is just taking stuff to trial willy new, right? It's just not happening that much. So there are, you are gonna run into attorneys who are going to be hella resistant to taking anything to trial um, because of various reasons of their own personal discomfort. It's gonna take too long, it's expensive. I can't, um, I can't handle a hundred cases if I got to take all a hundred of them to trial. I can handle a hundred cases if I only got to take six to trial, <laughs> right? Um, but it's about dollars and cents because for many, many attorneys, it is, you know, that we, that's they living. That's how they make a living. It's banging out guilty pleas. It's banging out traffic shit. It's banging out misdemeanors with guilty pleas. I have two more questions and I, I know the answer, but I know you'll you'll be able to strategize on it again because we talk about this all the time. DA has the highest power in the in the system. Everybody keeps forgetting about that DA that you that you put in there, but don't forget them judges either now. So um that's right. You 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 your voting process is the DA and definitely the judge, but that DA can push a lot of things. Oh yeah, but make that, no mistake, because they can we change would... that. They can change the venue. They can change whoever's on that bench so they can still get their charges gone. So don't, right. don't get it twisted. Um, this question is, can, now we know this, can they utilize past charges against you in making a decision that was not involved in a current case? So, you know, we have seen people um, go up and get additional charges or have put more time or more money because of their previous charges that had nothing to do with the current case. Yeah, of course. Uh, in North Carolina, they're called, and everywhere for that matter, they're called sentencing enhancers, okay? So based on your prior record level, how many previous convictions you have, that is going to determine based on structured sentencing, how much time you're exposed to um, for, our, for any particular crime. So what does that mean? In North Carolina, for example, let's say that you have five prior felony convictions. Um, so based on this calculation that they have, that makes you a prior record level four, okay? Um, on our sentencing grid, I think there's prior record levels go from one, which means you've never been convicted of anything before to six, which means you've been, you've been convicted of a bunch of stuff, right? So for the, same for the same crime though, depending on what your prior record level is, your exposure to prison time is greater the higher your prior record level is. So if you rob a liquor store at a prior record level of zero, let's say um, just hypothetically that your exposure to prison time might be one to three years. The same person for the same crime, same activity who has been convicted six times before may have a range of 10 to 15 years in prison for that same crime, okay? 
So invariably, if you have been convicted of crimes before in North Carolina and you are convicted of another crime, it is necessarily going to increase the amount of time that you will spend in jail or in prison rather for whatever it is that you are accused of. So that is one way you, that your prior convictions are used um, in every and every time that you get in trouble again, your prior convictions are used to determine and to elongate the exposure that you have to, to serving prison time or to being um, indebted to the state. Uh, the other way is sentence enhancers. So that means on top of that one to six prior record level, right? So that's spectrum, that scale of the more crimes you have, the more prior convictions you have, the more time you're exposed to, you can also be found to be a habitual felon, which means that in North Carolina, let's say that you have been convicted of three previous felonies, okay? The next time you get convicted of a felony, you can also be charged as a habitual felon which means that you committed a lot of, you commit felonies habitually over and over again, right? And you can be punished for that. Uh, it used to be that if you were um, charged habitually, that you were sentenced at a class C level, no matter what you did. Um, they changed that, um, and let me see. Uh, let me let me make, let me put that into some context. Let me ground that. So, uh, class A1 felony is first degree murder. That's as serious as it gets, right? And then it goes down from there. So A, B, C, D goes down to I, okay? So an I felony is going to give you much less exposure to, to jail time than an A felony is, okay? Um, so bumping someone up to a C was huge, right? What you would see very, very often in North Carolina, even though they don't collect this data the way they should, um, there are trends moving towards people trying to collect this data. What we know is that more black and brown people are charged habitually than white folks. And that you could have three prior felony convictions. Let's say they're all, um, you have three I felony convictions that you got in three different court settings, right? But they're low, low level felonies. You have never served a day in prison. But because you have three prior felony convictions, you can be habitualized, which means now that if you commit another I felony, instead of getting sentenced at an I level, you're going to be sentenced four alphabet letters higher, right? So the amount of prison time, so, so in theory, you could be a habitual felon that has never served a day in prison, get habitualized and end up for your first, your first time to prison being 15 years. Crazy. So yes, your prior convictions can be used against you in any number of ways. Now, for um, folks that are watching, the way that your prior convictions are most often and, and the charge that we see most prevalently is, drum roll please, felon in possession of a firearm. Because, because you have a prior felony conviction, you are precluded from owning a firearm. So if you have, or except for certain exceptions, but that we don't need to get into that. What we see more than anything else is that people who end up back in prison because they've been convicted of a felony before and they get caught with a gun. That is a new standalone charge that is in essence based upon a prior conviction because if you did not have that prior conviction, you could not be found to be in violation of a law that is based on you needing a prior conviction prior conviction in order for that law to be violated. So there's all kinds of ways that prior convictions are used to enhance sentencing and to, um, to create new crimes and to expose people to, to, um, 
to more carceral impact. Uh, another example is if someone, for example, is on the um, sex offender registry and you are on the sex offender registry and you don't show up or, or and you live within a certain a certain mile radius of a school or a place where children are. That is a crime. That is an, an independent charge that you, a crime that you can be charged with. So if you are on the sex registry and which means you have been convicted of some type of, of some type of offense that makes you eligible to be put on the sex registry in the past and you are still on that registry and you are within a certain radius of children, you have committed another crime, even if you haven't done anything. Just the fact that you are on the registry and are living within a certain amount of distance or feet away from a school or a church or a park, that in and of itself is a crime. Does that answer the question? Yes, you did. Thank you, Attorney Don Blake Grove. Um, we're going to get ready to close out here. Um, we're going to allow James to take over. I appreciate your service to us in the community as well as Fayetteville PAC partners um, for the last five years. And let's keep fighting. Thank you. It is my pleasure. And I am just before I stop sharing my screen, let me just da -da 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 -da, real quick to this last one. If you um, have any questions, or concerns, you can always find me at um, oh, this one. Don't work. So yeah, I put I put your um I put Perfect. your um website in the chat as well as the information in the chat, um, along with your police um your police misconduct form that database. You thank you. I appreciate well. that. Yes, ma'am. Um, so thank you all for uh, anybody who are still here and who is listening. Um, if you learned anything, I hope so. I hope that you did. And thank you so much for caring about these issues and dedicating a, uh, good Lord, is it Wednesday? A Wednesday, <laughs> a Wednesday night to talking about something so heavy, but together um, through our knowledge, through, through information and through exercising our own power, we can change these systems. We do not have to be a victim to these systems. All right, thank you. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, it most definitely right. That's one of the main things that I drew from it is like everything comes back to like who we elect. Mm -hmm. The power is in our hand. And the most important thing is knowledge. Like actually knowing because a lot of things we can't get ourselves out of until we know what we're in. That's right. So that's one of the main things that I drew from it. This is very informative. I learned a lot of information a lot more like the 94% of public state cases is guilty plea and the 97, that was a huge number. I, if you asked me to guess, I wouldn't have guessed that much. No. Okay. Uh, um, appreciate you once again for coming and sharing your information with us and make sure if you're watching, if you're watching, make sure you join us on Friday. We're gonna have Manuel and Monique back here talking about task force recommendations. This time we'll be discussing cover-ups and justice for the victims and finding and talking about solutions for them. So once again, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm James. Thank you, Ms. Nod. Thank you, Ms. Kathy Chalico. And we'll see you guys on Friday. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody.